thank you, everybody. Uh, very great. Uh, it's delighted to see you. I have to say I'm even more delighted because uh, 15 minutes ago, I wasn't quite sure that I was going to be on this stage because I was uh, in the Excel Center uh, where, the, uh, where last year's AI Summit took place and I uh, uh, moderated a discussion. Uh, I was looking around some uh, very interesting looking gym equipment thinking this can't be right uh, and uh, rang uh, Chris and he told me that we were here. So fortunately, I had my Brompton that I bought six weeks ago, which has uh, paid for itself uh, 10 times <laughs> over there, I can tell you. Um, I'm uh, obviously very honoured to be surrounded by such uh, erudite, authoritative uh, panellists today. Uh, that is very good news from my point of view, because my background, as some of you may know, uh, was in uh, political and general journalism, uh, not in uh, science. Uh, so I will be testing to destruction the maxim that there's no such thing as a stupid question uh, uh, in, in this panel today. What I will uh, ask, first of all, for each of our panelists to just give us a, a few minutes of uh, an appraisal as to how they see the current landscape and perhaps how you know, it's moved on uh, over the, uh, the past 12 months and where the, the, the next uh, the areas of big potential are. We obviously have Rachel representing the, the government from the Department of uh, Business, Energy uh, and Industrial Strategy, uh, Keith from Fujitsu and uh, Philip with the perspective from uh, Financial Services uh, and, uh, and HSBC. Uh, so I'll allow them, if you like, to, to open up one by one, then I'll ask them a few questions and obviously very keen uh, after that to uh, have the opportunity for you to ask some questions as well. So uh, why don't I, uh, Rachel, why don't you kick off with the, with the view from, uh, from Whitehall uh, as to how we we are progressing to becoming that quantum ready economy. Sure, thank you. Um, so just to introduce myself, um, uh, I'm Rachel Mays, so I'm the head of quantum technologies at Bayes, so I head up the quantum team um, and we work within a wider team on technology strategy and security. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a great question in terms of where are we and where have we come from um, and I think I'm quite new to quantum for so the last couple of years for me, so I have a background in tech strategy and policy. Um, and just so much has changed over that period. Um, I think we've got a really vibrant community of startups in the UK, um, and the quantum program, which has been going for a number of years now, you know, has really started to create a lot of um, you know, actual real world examples of use cases for quantum, speaking more generally than compute. Um, so I think, I think the UK is in a good place um, and in terms of quantum, that, that sort of quantum readiness journey, I think I'm yeah, interested to talk today about how, um, how people can actually start to start their journey uh, and what the different phases are. So I can talk a bit about the, the strategy and the programme probably a bit later on. Great, uh, fantastic. Um, Keith, let me turn to, turn to you. You obviously have a lot of uh, interactions and touch points uh, over the years with, with the public sector, with, with government and governments uh, as well. Uh, t take me through how you see the, the value of that link and how you see uh, things moving right at the moment. So, I mean, we, we announced, um, along with the ministerial announcements, the, the last couple of days, the, the establishment of our Centre for Cognitive and Advanced Technologies, which, which is aimed specifically at, at the rapid commercialisation of research. So, sitting slightly to the right of, of the D of R&D, and how do we commercialise technologies faster? Um, it, one of the reasons for establishing that is because th this is a problem that both the UK and Japan has, right? Um, so, in the UK, we want to be a science superpower. We're third on the on, in the world for research, as as we all are very proud. Um, and, uh, and and on almost every league table or, or assessment, that's the case. Um, but when you look at our ability to commercialise that research at scale, we um, have not been performing in recent years since about 2010 in the way we would want to. And in fact, there's an ERC, an Enterprise Research Council paper that shows us going backwards consistently in that period. I mean, that said, as you've heard from all the ministerial announcements today, uh, over the last few days, there have been record amounts of investment in the last 12 months. There's a science um, council that the Prime Minister chairs. There's a whole raft of things that are going on in government that giving commercial organisations and academia touch points to, to try to understand how we solve that problem. So I think compared to 12 months ago, we're, we're light years ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to reach for the obvious analogy here and not doing so. Um, <laughs> but, but we are certainly a leap ahead from where we were 12 months ago. Um, and I think that's a lot of that owes um, its origin to the science superpower agenda that was laid out in the integrated review, which I'm, I'm very proud to have played a role in during my time in number 10. But, but equally now, uh, what you see is that, I mean, that just sets the, the headmark 
and the direction. And what you see now is um, the intensifying technical, technological competition between states globally. And then you see that flowing down through the direction the integrated re review gave into multiple departments, agencies, and bodies, creating touch points to enable the commercialization of technology faster and to enable us to compete globally. So uh, really, we, we are so much further on than we possibly could have imagined when we, um, you were speaking to Dave Snelling, I think, this time last year. Um, but much, much further on than we were then. And we, we're pleased to play a role in helping accelerate that even further through the CK. Great. Well, I'll come back and sure there, there'll be lots more questions around, around that agenda. It feels like, you know, collaboration is going to be a word that's going to come up uh, a lot. And, and of course, Philip, in terms of collaboration within the, with the, within the commercial sector, I know that you, you uh, HSBC, HSBC, sorry, have been working alongside uh, Fujitsu over the past 12 months as well. I mean, wh where do you see uh, the benefits of, uh, of seeking that expertise uh, and partnership uh, agenda driving things forward? And how, how, how much progress do you feel that you've made? been able to make over, over the past few months? Sure. So uh, maybe first of all, let, let me start just in terms of this sort of question in where we are with progress. Um, so I've, I've been in financial services for um, over a, a decade, but my educational background and uh, interest was actually in quantum. And I was actually part of the um, Cambridge and Toshiba research groups who were developing QKD systems. And so I like to think about the progress of quantum computing um, to compare to that because quantum communications is somewhat more mature, but we've literally gone from laboratory experiments um, to where we are today that you can buy these systems and you can send data through quantum networks that are protected by the laws of quantum mechanics. And so I think that's a really encouraging sign for where quantum computing is going to go um, uh, as well. And I think you know, there is a common theme today around investment, and there has been huge amounts of investment in this technology uh, over the last uh, 10 years, but what's really quite interesting and eye-opening is the level of investment we've seen over the last few years from commercial organizations like HSBC. And that's because um, we're starting to realize that the potential of quantum computing is so big um, that it's really gonna have a huge impact to both customer experiences and to the balance sheet. And so it's a really exciting time to be part of this sort of quantum uh, journey. Now, um, to your specific question about the work with Fujitsu, we're relatively early in our uh, quantum strategy at HSBC, and um, a key part of our um, strategy, a key pillar of our strategy, is partnerships and collaboration. We know we can't do this together. Um, we know that we need to work with hardware specialists, software specialists, academia, consortiums um, support the government sort of um, working groups that uh, are being put together. The, the only way we'll succeed in this is by uh, working very collectively to ultimately uh, identify where, where the final applications are. Um, and so the, uh, the work we've been doing with Fujitsu on the value assessment has helped us sort of, um, it's been our first attempt to structure the different use cases coming from uh, areas of the business um, in, a, in a way that helps us assess the viability, the feasibility, um, the type of technology, quantum technology, that would, uh, uh, that would work well with that particular use case, and also the commercial side and the customer side. And so it, it's almost like a toll gate process wh which helps you figure out the ones that you want to do deep research on at the end. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we're ultimately interesting, uh, interested in uh, developing applications um, that are real problems you know, within the bank today. I want to ask you about um, the uh, communications issue, if you like. I mean, I come from a communications background. Uh, and quantum computing is one of those issues where it has a sort of a key challenge associated with it. Well, one, complexity. So uh, explaining to people uh, in a way that, that, they, that can feel tangible uh, to them. But also, I, I think that uh, it's fair to say that there's a lot of talk of, of potential of where it, where it is likely to take us. Uh, and of course, whether it be governments or, or private sector, everybody wants to see uh, delivery on that potential uh, and they want to see something uh, tangible and, and that they can get hold of. Where do you feel that we're at on that, if I, perhaps, Keith, I asked you first of all, on, on that sort of communications journey? So I think 
We, we're seeing increasing demand for the kind of quantum value assessment that uh, uh, far-sighted organisations like H HSBC have invested in, which looks at, says, well, what's here now? What can we do tomorrow with quantum-inspired and, and, and available quantum technologies? And what's there tomorrow? And quantum networks is one in order to protect your data. We know globally there are states and organisations that are caching emails that they believe they'll be able to decrypt when quantum computing is real. So when you, when you talk about something as tangible as that, people can understand, okay, this is cybersecurity, um, but it's cybersecurity as we envisage needing it in five years. And so we need to do something to protect that data, which we'd still be worried about if someone decrypted it five years later. And financial data is an obvious example where you'd still worry. Um, we're seeing applications for the Fujitsu Digital Annealer, which is quantum inspired, but um, I think the thing to say, so you say quantum inspired because it's not real quantum. But the thing is, the, Nature just did a, a benchmarking study across all the different annealers, including true quantum. The Fujitsu and the digital annealer came out top with the 2018 version, which is 92% less capable than the one that organizations are applying now. So that's absolutely world leading, and we're applying that in logistics, in, with port authorities, with rail, with rail companies. That's, so it's a, you're seeing like spin outs from the quantum program that people can understand because it's solving real world problems. And I think that's. That's the key. Now, I think the next kind of the next generation of, of that, um, making it more explainable to, to customers and clients and those might you, you, who might use it, will be through quantum simulation. So we have um, Dave will correct me if I get this wrong, but I think it's a 36-bit um, quantum simulator in, in Japan, and we're going to announce one later. Well, I won't get too far ahead, but we, we will be improving on that. And that that is reaching the limits of current. Um, supercomputing capacity to do the simulation, but it allows you to test, well, what would happen if we had a quantum computer tomorrow? To start to play around, to start to build the algorithms in the same kind of operating systems that you'll later use when true quantum computers are here. So now we're beginning to, to experiment and test and see real world use cases that you can use through, through quantum simulation. You can apply annealing to, to, annealing to real world problems. And then there are simple stories to tell. Like on the stage last year, I talked about, I showed the graph that showed how every major breakthrough in AI has come through increases in computational power. Um, and you know, again, uh, channeling the, the Dr. Snelling, who's I think manning our cell at the moment. But and we were discussing, well, how do I how do I communicate the amount of computational power that would be created if we had true quantum? And he said, well, it'd be like super log linear, Keith. It'd like it'd blow your graph apart, and then we you know, geeked out on what, what it might actually look like. But I think that that's instantly understandable, right? You can go, okay, here's here's what we've achieved with increasing compute, everything from AlphaGo zero, things that people understand. Well, quantum computing blows that chart apart, and so the the applications of that. Are, are both unimaginable, but you can begin to interpolate what they might be if you look back at, at what we've achieved through increases in, in computational power more broadly. So I think there's a kind of here now real world problem story, and then there's a way of telling the story that makes sense for people and what it means in the longer term. I want to come back to that issue of the unimaginable that you, the, the, that you raised, because I think trying to sell the unimaginable in a policy uh, um, framework can be a challenge. Uh, but let, let me come back to that in a minute. It, 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 from your perspective in the financial services uh, uh, arena, how much of what Keith was saying feel, feels familiar to, to you in terms of what your, what your organization is seeking to do with quantum? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, for us, um, it, is e it isn't even about the unimaginable. It's about the percentage differences and compared to what we can do today. Um, and so, the, you know, the, the types of um, use case we're seeing cover things like optimization, machine learning, simulation, you know, the, the, the ones that we've, we've seen here before, and cyber, of course, which is not quantum computing per se, but a response to quantum computing. And if I take sort of the example of fraud detection, um, if we can train our fraud detection models even slightly uh, better than we do today with quantum machine learning, it's, you know, that's a, that's a global uh, that's a global impact in terms of, you know, you reduce uh, the number of false positives, you can reduce the number of false negatives, it means you're stopping more fraud and you're stopping, you know, fewer transactions that shouldn't be stopped as fraud, um, uh, flagged as fraud. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, those things are not unimaginable, but they are very, very important to customers uh, and, uh, and the bottom line. So, Rachel, tell me, what are the levers that the government is seeking to pull, the, 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 the programs that you're engaged in at the moment to ensure that, uh, that in terms of quantum computing and within that broader science superpower uh, agenda, we, we as, a, as a nation uh, are leading the way? That's a great question. Uh, just, just coming back to the communications piece briefly. Um, so I think there is a responsibility for government and the sector to you know, to be honest about and manage expectations about what is possible by when with quantum computing. Um, so one of the key ways that we're doing that is through the National Quantum Computing Centre, 
um, which is set up to work with businesses and the industry itself, so we're not looking to replicate what the industry is doing. We're helping to facilitate and build that industry. Um, so the National Quantum Computing Center has a Spark program, which is around quantum readiness. Um, and it is about working with sectors to say, you know, where are you on your quantum journey? Because, well, as, as government is as well, people will be in different places. Mm. So they're taking them through that journey and raising awareness, helping them to upskill and think about, you know, starting to explore where are the key areas that this will be most impactful for our business. Um, so that's one of the key bits of the existing quantum program. Um, I think another key, you know, we've had a quantum program since 2014 and it's now coming to an end. So part of the strategy thinking, so the strategy will come out later this year and part of the thinking is what next for that program. But also, you know, how, how does government work with industry uh, users and the quantum industry to, to, to really um, make sure that we're giving people the best chance to be early adopters. Um, and it is hard, I, you know, I'm not going to pretend it's, it's, <laughs> it's an easy thing, um, but I think starting on that journey is really important. Um, so in terms of the wider program, we have the um, ISCF programs, so that's really about creating a better network in the UK of users, industry, um, academia, to, to really work on those problems together. Um, and look at commercialization, build the supply chain. Um, and then in terms of other activities, we have the quantum hubs across the UK, and they focus on comms, compute, sensing and timing and imaging. And again, their role is really to work with industry, both users and um, supply chain and components companies to actually work together on, on applications. Um, I will, I'm eager to throw it open to, for questions to, to the uh, floor in a, in a moment. Can I just come back, as I said I would, to that issue of the, the uh, sort of unimaginable. Um, uh, I was quite taken by uh, the anecdote, I think, that you used in the speech perhaps last year about the, when the supercomputer was playing the world champion of Go. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how the experts and the, you know, the top players that were scrutinizing that game uh, were sort of discombobulated, if you like. They were yeah. disconcerted because it felt as though the, the computer was not playing a game that was familiar to them. It was not playing by the rules, not, spe not speaking the language of the, of the game as they understood it. And I think that what you were saying is that we have to, to some extent, to have faith. To, to have faith that, that these, this technology uh, will take us to a place uh, that we, we can sort of see the, the, the direction, but we have to basically let it do its thing to some extent. Uh, and I wondered whether, I mean, because I, I, as a former journalist, my sort of mindset or my way of coming at things is perhaps skepticism uh, and there's a lot of skepticism and cynicism around in the world at the moment. So how do you bridge that communications gap, if you like, of saying to people that, 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 that trust in this technology uh, and, and have that leap of faith? Well, I think talking about multiple different things. So one, one, one way is through investing in explainable AI, which we, we do both in Japan and, and in the UK with the University of Manchester. So AI, that, you, that it, an equivalent of, if you might think of that famous move, it's something like move 36 or 37, where um, as Kiji, who's the world Go champion, gets out, up, walks out, holding his head in his hands because he's just not quite sure what it's done, and the commentators go silent to say it's like watching an alien, a creature, a god, someone from the future play the game, right? Um, well, if you had the kind of explainable AI that we're working on, it would have it would have been able to explain why it had um, undertaken that move. So you, and then, in the same way that a human player might be able to say, "Well, I was taking a bit of a punt, but I thought if I did this, then they would do that, and they would do the other." So at the moment, you don't have that because the, the, the algorithm doesn't it doesn't have any history with it. It's just mm. it's just optimizing. Um, so that firstly is investing in the kind of technologies that might enable machine learning to become explainable. Um, I think the other thing is baselining performance um, against, hu against human performance. So quite often um, you will trust and delegate authority to a human without them being explainable, without really knowing what you know, um, why they're doing what they do. And I think it's beginning to understand that it's the same authority to delegate that you're talking about with machines. And then if I can bring it back to sort of quantum, what I was talking about last year was how if it, with that, um, the kind of power of compute that we have, you're now operating in a mathematical state space so wide and a recursive depth so deep, you know, by recursion, I mean, if you do that, then I should do this. Um, but it, it's going to take us beyond, well beyond story and narrative. And I think that's true, but if you can begin to build 
quantum algorithms in the same way we're talking about building machine learning, um, trying not, use, not to use the term, but the, the kind of explainable algorithms that we're working on, then again, you, you can begin to see how that might in the longer term become explainable. So it's about investing in the kind of technologies that, that create a safer version of AI so that when you're running quantum algorithms, you, you can trust it. And then I think just in terms of telling the story, I think, I think that's, that's the key thing. It's, it's making sure that you're explaining that you're not just investing in seizing the opportunity, you're also aware of the downside risk and that you're investing from the start in developing to protect people against those and then that you're assuring the systems before deployment. And of course, we, you know, we do that in the things that we're deploying today with digital annealing and, and, and uh, simulation and such like. So um, different levels depending on where you are and how you tell the story. But, it, but it's also um, understanding that when it gets beyond story, we're going to need it to explain back to us how it's got there. OK, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's very illuminating. Do, were there some questions uh, from the floor at all? The, uh, I've got a couple here. The gen uh, gentleman, I think there's a microphone coming, if you don't mind holding on just for a, just for a second. We'll, pro we'll take the two questions. There's a, the, the, the gentleman here, and they're also just, be just behind as well. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> uh, hey, Karamijan from DHL. Um, it's been mentioned a few times that there's like a threat um, with regards to people holding on to or harnessing data uh, that's encrypted by today's standards, and at some point in the future, I guess the expectation it will be that they could be decrypted and all the secrets would come out. So I guess to a certain extent, that's kind of um, a bit too late if you want to do something now. But are there any uh, guidelines that people are aware of with regards to what an organization can do? I guess the government's probably in a, um, you know, they've got bigger secrets or more important secrets, let's say, than the commercial company. but. Um, are there any sort of guidelines uh, with regards to how to protect your data uh, from, from that threat? Uh, and shall I take the question just behind you uh, as well? Wait, did you have a question as well? Yeah, please. <coughs> Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the conversation. It's been very interesting. My name is Vinay Deary. I'm from uh, D-Orbit. Um, and I just uh, noticed in the title we have uh, winning the global race. And my question is, who are we racing against? and why, and I could offer up a couple of things that I've heard, climate disaster or China, uh, and then also what is the value of framing this as a race? Okay, uh, I, let, let, let me touch on the, the issue of uh, data security, first of all. That, that, Philip, that's, that's one that you, you touched on earlier on that is, is a pre preoccupation. How, how much of the, the reason that HSBC is investing in, in this area is because uh, you know, obviously, you have to. You have a. You know, you have to be able to protect uh, data, uh, and you can see that somewhere around the corner, there there is a risk that people are going to be developing these sorts of systems uh, and using them for malicious purposes. So you want to get ahead uh, ahead of them. I guess is, is that is that part of the preoccupation? And how would you advise uh, other companies that are, that, that are wondering what they should be doing in this area? Yeah, I think, um, so the, the threat of quantum computers uh, to um, encryption, RSA, and, you know, it's made very famous through Shaw's algorithm of the, the mid-90s, um, that's really what catapulted a lot of this work with quantum computing in the first place. And I think there's a, I, I've got a, a couple of thoughts on this. The first is <coughs> we shouldn't forget actually how far away we need to get technologically before we will find... Uh, fault tolerance in quantum computers that will be able to decrypt uh, methods of encryption we commonly use today. Um, there, there's a number of significant technological milestones that need to be overcome, uh, number of qubits, the, the quality of them, uh, uh, the, the scalability, and, and all of that good, uh, the good stuff. Um, and I think the second sort of uh, uh, thought is that a lot of these quantum computers need to be accessed through certain providers, and, and therefore there is some infrastructure you would hope would some, somehow protect against malicious use cases. Now, having said that, um, the, uh, the point that the questioner raised around the store now, decrypt later type of attacks is a, is a real problem. And so this is something, cybersecurity is something that organizations should definitely be thinking about. It's something we're thinking about. Um, and in particular, the store now, decrypt later is a mechanism where data being transmitted today can literally be stored, wait till a quantum computer becomes available, and then it can be decrypted and your information can be um, revealed. 
And so it's probably a good thing to do to think about doing like a, a cybersecurity audit within your organization and figure out which types of communications are more hypersensitive uh, because those ones in particular are going to be susceptible to the store now decrypt later attack. You know, something which is still going to be uh, a problem if it was decrypted in 10 years' time. Um, you you want to be thinking about protecting against that now. And there's a couple of things you can do. Um, so you can deploy quantum key distribution systems. Um, uh, which is available commercially now, um, and you can start uh, running your data through um, uh, those, uh, uh, you know, fiber networks or, or, or others, and, and, and that's one way of uh, protecting against it. But probably the, the more likely way that organizations are going to have to shift is by changing their um, encryption protocols. And there's a lot of work that NIST are doing, uh, uh, National Institute for um, uh, security um, uh, standards, and I think it will be. It won't be long before we start to see two or three or four types of algorithms coming out of um, their work, uh, where companies are going to have to seriously think about how they m change the way they encrypt their data today to those new pro protocols. And that's going to require a lot of testing. It's going to be a big transition period. So it's on one hand, it's you know, it's a a little bit away in terms of uh, quantum computers need to have a lot of development, but it is something that organizations should be thinking about now, particularly for hypersensitive uh, data. Um, turning to the, the, the question about the, the, the race, uh, I mean, that, that, I guess, to some extent feels a, a quite familiar, a sort of political framing of, uh, of things in the sense that it's a competitive marketplace. Uh, countries are going to want to be competing for inward investment uh, to ensure that their, that their skill, the de development of skills uh, uh, is uh, adequate. Uh, as I say, that you know, companies like HSBC and Fujitsu are going to want to come to the UK to, to operate in these emerging technologies. But I wondered, Ra Rachel, when you are obviously you know, having discussions with, uh, with ministers and, and, and other politicians about the merits of, invest uh, of, of advancing this, this sort of issue, is it is one of the key levers or the things that they can get a handle on is that they they recognize that when there is an emerging market like this that they they're worried that they might actually you know end up missing the boat and they they, they recognize that they have to have to be in there early I, I think that is important just to touch on the um, the security piece so the national cyber security center is the authority um, in the UK for cyber so they have produced a white paper that provides guidance on how industry can take steps to protect their data uh, against the threat of quantum computers in the future. It is, it is in the future, I agree. Um, and the UK is involved in, this, in the development of those um, post-quantum algorithms through, through NIST, so it's a global effort. Um, but, uh, so, so, but yes, it's a very good point. You know, I think the UK, through the integrated review, has set out its global position for um, uh, you know, interacting with the world, and science and tech is a key part of that. So I think most of the framing for quantum is around the fact that the UK has key strengths in this area. So we are globally leading in a lot of the, the science for quantum. Um, but, you know, we won't do it alone. It will be in collaboration with key countries around the world. So, um, yes, it, <laughs> it's talked about within that context, but I think ministers do recognize the, 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 the huge opportunity from quantum and the, the fact that the UK is well positioned to, to take advantage and enable the wider economy to take advantage. Did you have any observations, Keith? Yeah, if you, don't, if you don't mind. So look, I think there's, there are things that are here now because we know that there are states that are caching emails in anticipation of being able to decrypt them in the future. And we should be worried about that. You should be worried about that if you're a business that is concerned about your data being leaked against you. Because we, we see that happen, where data is leaked against a corporation if it does something that one state or another doesn't like. And so you need to be thinking now, would I be worried about if that data leaked in? You decide when true quantum computing will be here, if it's ever here. But is it three years? Is it five years? Is it 10 or more? But you need to, to make a judgment. and consider it, I think. Um, I agree um, exactly with what Philip said. On, on like the, the thing now is just good cyber security is enough, and then they haven't got your emails to, to decrypt them. Um, we developed a solution with Cambridge Quantum Computing last year to provide a quantum secure network, which is another way of like that way you're already reinforced. If somebody gets that breakthrough tomorrow, um, so that they, they, can, they can begin to use quantum in uh, quantum computing to enable cyber attacks on a massive scale, well, you're already secure against it. 
And then data-centric security is something that our defense and national security business is operating in heavily. So even if you get if you get through the security of the network, which you wouldn't on a quantum secure network anyway, but if your existing network does, then your data itself um, is protected at that level. And I think that's another, another way of beginning to think about it. I, I'm going to have to defend the idea of a race being important because you know, it's one of those that wrote about it, and I think it is a race. And I don't, I don't think it's helpful to pretend otherwise. I'm a, a national security professional by background prior to um, you know, working in business um, and, and a psychologist. And, and like, we, something that I think will be familiar to everyone is that we um, compete and cooperate. That's what humans do every day. We compete and cooperate with colleagues, with, with others. That's, that's what humans do, and that's what states do too. They compete and cooperate at all levels at all times. And that, um, that competition can be super healthy, right? It can be like the competition to, to make the first 11 of, a, of a, a football team, for example. It can be a competition, so, and if you think about that in an alliance context, where you're competing to offer the most in the alliance, which the, the, the result of that is that your alliance is stronger. And that's important because it decides what kind of a world you want to live in. So I, I, I think it does matter. I think it can be profoundly galvanizing as well. As humans, we tend to be galvanized by that sense of competition and challenge. And so I think it, I think it matters. I don't think you'd have the 24.1 billion <coughs> investment in quantum computing globally that was talked about this morning if we didn't all have that sense of competition. And then I think it matters because one of the worries with both breakthroughs in, in um, artificial intelligence and quantum is, is what is the, is the possibility of reaching a kind of escape velocity where progress becomes self-reinforcing. So by being the first to, to true quantum, can somebody, can somebody catch you? When we had the nuclear breakthroughs, it was clear that you could be caught, right? We kind of met a threshold. You either had nuclear weapons or you didn't, and then people could develop, and that we knew where we were. With true quantum computing, it's possible that the scientific breakthroughs that follow mean that you're constantly ahead. And so if you don't keep up with that progress, and a, and a nation state that has a profoundly different set of values makes that breakthrough before you do, well, now you have a really big global problem because that, that country's relative power compared to everybody else's would be so far in advance of your own that your ability to compete diminishes consistently. So I think this kind of technological competition matters because it decides what kind of world we, we want to live in. And so I think it's profoundly important. And I think it, it, would, it would be irresponsible not to frame it as a race because the reality is it is. Uh, we've got uh, a couple more minutes. There's a question there, please. Um, hi, uh, Faisal Kamran from Saudi. Um, I very much like uh, the response which we just recently got uh, from Keith regarding the race. I also believe that the race is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but actually it, it instills a lot of competition and a good competition too. But I still believe that there is a, some sort of a framing that needs to be done around the psychology of the human beings to how do you put that across uh, generations. You said about cooperation as well as compet competition. Um, so if you sort of constantly talk about only security, which insists in fear, so you are doing something because you're going to have the fear of missing out. It's not about investing only in the opportunity, but you are afraid because your competitor is going to become better at something and it's going to leave you behind. So my question is that when you decide on these huge investments in billions and billions of dollars and pounds, is it motivated by the fear just because you want to be ahead of, um, in a certain global environment, or is it because you want to invest into the technology which is going to safeguard the future in terms of the improvements of the life of the people. The way I see it is there's no technology worth investment if it's not going to serve the mankind. So the, so the best thing, in my opinion, would be to subsidize the fear with the potential for the, up, um, the better minute to us in the community. Can I come straight back on that, Joe? Yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, look, yes is the answer. You, you, the, we, you know, Fujitsu is a commercial company. It invests because it sees commercial opportunity. It sees all the possibilities. I talked through. I talked about the potential for massive scientific breakthroughs that will come in everything from the life sciences to health to you name it. It, it will be revolutionary um, in the, in in what it can enable through the through scientific research and breakthroughs. And that's another reason why everyone's racing for it. I also think that the message that you're competing to. Um, uh, and that, when you think from the national perspective, the message that you're competing to protect your citizens and to advance their prosperity and security is also a positive one. It's not just a negative. Like I said, it's like, like the competition to be in the first 11 of a football team. It's the competition to be as match fit as you can be to enable the, the prosperity and security of your citizens. And the, U, the UK as a nation seeks power with rather than power over allies. So the idea is that, that once you have that, then you're trying to enable everybody to, um, to rise and, and prosper. So I think, I think 
think it's both. And I think from a commercial perspective, we wouldn't be investing if we didn't see the opportunity here and see how much value it can add to the economy. And that's both through annealing today, quantum simulation today, and, and tomorrow perhaps true quantum. And you know, we, Philip's here talking about some of the things we've done with them, but there are a whole range of a portfolio of clients now that are looking for opportunities that they can seize, not yesterday, but well, not tomorrow rather, but today. Um, and so, and that's all about opportunity rather than fear. Let's, let's cr cr in the spirit of optimism, let's cram in one last question for the gentleman. <laughs> Is this working? Yeah. Yep. I had a, a comment on the gentleman from DHL. He was asking about how do you prepare today? And um, I think one of the things to understand about that is that you're pretty safe if you've got symmetric, symmetric keys and symmetric encryption. Quantum won't defeat that. It's the time of flight uh, handshaking period where you can get intercepted. So you have to look at all the boundaries to your system and look at how, how that is working today and how that could basically just disappear tomorrow. Um, and I think there's a few mitigating strategies you can do, which is how much data you're moving down one channel. If you spread across multiple channels, a bit like um, wireless hopping in, in spread spectrum, how much can you actually be attacked if you're not putting everything down one channel? You maybe lose a few emails, but you don't lose everything. So you can do those kind of techniques now before quantum comes and gets you at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we're, we're at time, so uh, we should wrap there. I'm hugely grateful to the panellists for uh, very, very uh, insightful and exciting. Uh, so, it, as, you, as you say, I mean, it's important that we should, and I understand, obviously, from your national security background, that one should be mindful of threats, but not, uh, uh, not, not fear-mongering. Uh, I hope it was coming from the coming from the stage. Uh, there's a lot to be positive about, and uh, and uh, I look forward to probably talking about more advances in a year's time. And I will definitely check my diary more closely <laughs> then. When this when today has finished, you can get a free recommendation for me. The, the cycle superhighway out towards Docklands is uh, is lovely this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Joey. Thank you. Thank you.